Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Avis Budget Group stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Avis Budget Group is the third largest rental car company behind Enterprise and Hertz. The company is headquartered in New Jersey and was founded in 1946. It went public in 83 and currently trades on the NASDAQ, Deutsche Borsa, Mexican Bolsa, and the London Stock Exchange. It is the parent company of Avis Car Rental, Budget Car Rental, Budget Truck Rental, Zipcar, just to name a few. It operates in South Africa, North America, South America, India, Australia, and New Zealand. Let's get started with the model. This is a mid-cap company, $6.3 billion market cap. They're trading at $89 a share, and they have 70 million shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future, and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. You can see their free cash flow is a big negative every year. I'll explain a little more about this later. Net income is the profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that's positive each year except in 2020, negative 684 million. Revenue is a sales for the company. And that was growing each year a little bit up through 2019. Then it dropped a lot due to COVID in 2020. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. They had their lowest sales in 2020 because a lot of people were stuck in their homes not traveling due to COVID. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. And the difference between those two numbers is the gross profit. Their highest gross profit was in 2019 at $7.1 billion. Below that is operating expenses such as marketing and depreciation, then below that is operating income. And that was negative in 2020 due to lower sales. Below that is the interest they pay in their debt, and they paid the most interest in 2020 at 558 million. Below that is other income and expenses. This is usually impairments or write-offs. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income. And they had a big negative in 2020, positive in prior years. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. You could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash because net income is your accounting profit and loss. It's not actual cash. Even though they had negative net income in 2020, they still generated $691 million of cash flow because the income statement has a lot of non-cash expenses on it, such as depreciation. Then you have capital expenditures, which are investments in property, plant, and equipment. Operating cash flow minus capex gives you your free cash flow. So it does appear that the company is losing a ton of free cash flow each year. Almost $5 billion in 2020, and much worse in prior years. They lost $10.5 billion in 2019. I pulled this bottom picture from their annual report. In Yahoo Finance, it says they had $13 billion of CapEx in 2019. Most of that is the purchase of vehicles. They purchased nearly $12.9 billion of vehicles. But that same year, they also received $10.5 billion from the sale of vehicles. So if you look at their free cash flow in 2019, it was negative $10.5 billion, but they sold nearly $10.5 billion of cars. So it's kind of like a wash. They had zero free cash flow because every year they're buying tons of cars. Each year they also sell tons of cars because as cars get old, they sell them so they could buy newer ones. A little later in this video, I'm gonna show you that I calculated their future free cash flows. So I had to take into account the proceeds from the sale of vehicles. It seems like they repurchase capital stock every year. They repurchased 200 million in 2017, 216 million, 67 million, 119 million. When a company repurchases capital stock, this decreases the shares outstanding, making your shares more valuable. They also took on a lot of debt in 2020. They seem to be doing a good job at paying down debt. They paid down 18.5 billion in 2020 and issued 14.5 billion, so they decreased their total debt load $4 billion. 2019 was a wash. In 2018, they added about $1 billion of debt, and 2017 was a wash. 
Let's look at the capital structure. Negative $155 million of equity. That means their liabilities are $155 million more than their assets. And they have about $14 billion of debt. So they're 100% debt. Their net debt is $13 billion. And their WAC is 8.08%. And that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 7.5 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $5.8 billion. We divide that by 70 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $83. They're trading at $89, so they're trading at an 8% premium. It's a sell according to the model. Simply Wall Street values the company at 106, so they're saying the stock is undervalued. They're saying it's a buy. Five analysts priced this stock in the past three months, and the average price target was $56. The low was 35, the high was 70. Remember what I said earlier, even though they have really big negative free cash flows, these numbers do not take into account the sale of vehicles. When you add back the sale of vehicles, their free cash flow looks a lot better. This is the stock price the last five years. So for about four years, it was pretty flat, then dropped in March, and now it's trading well above its all-time high. So if you bought the stock down here and you're currently holding, you're doing really well. They have a really high beta, 2.33, so the stock is really volatile. The stock has gone up 541% in the past 52 weeks, while the S&P 500 went up 47%. The 52-week low was $9, the high was $90, and the stock is trading well above its 50-day and 200-day moving average. About 1.5 million shares are traded each day on this stock. Of the 70 million shares outstanding, 50 million are on float. Most of the shares are held by institutions. Obviously, it cannot be above 100%. This is just a timing error in Yahoo's calculation, and about 15% of the shares on float are shorted. In the past year, this stock has crushed its industry and the market. Also in the past three years and five years, this stock has done a lot better than its industry and the market. Analysts are forecasting their earnings to grow 115% while its industry grows 23% and the market grows 17%. Analysts are forecasting their revenue to grow 18%, its industry 9%, and the market 9.5%. In the past five years, their annual earnings decreased 36%, its industry increased 2%, and the market increased 12%. In the past year, their earnings decreased 327%, its industry grew 11%, and the market grew 12%. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, you'd be at $48,000 today. That's a 17% annual return. The biggest shareholder is SRS Investment at 26%. BlackRock at 10%, Nomura at 7%, Vanguard, then Jefferies. SRS stands for Scott Rubin Services. The average PE ratio in the market is 33, the median is 22. PE is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They have negative net income, so we can't look at a PE. Their price of sales is 1.2, so investors are paying $1.20 for $1 revenue. That's a really good price to sales ratio. We can't look at their price to book because they have negative equity. Equity is assets minus liabilities in the balance sheet and that's negative 155 million. Their tangible equity is negative 2 billion since they have 1.9 billion of intangible assets on their balance sheet. They have negative EBIT, so they have negative return on invested capital. Also negative interest coverage ratio. We can't look at the ROE. And they can cover 90% of their current liabilities with their current assets. Their current assets are 700 million of cash and 800 million of receivables. The company does seem to be undercapitalized, but the free cash flow number does not take into account the sale of vehicles. If you add that back in, they're not really undercapitalized that much. The best way to look at ratios is to compare them to companies in the same industry. The only other company I did in the same industry is McGrath Rent Corp. McGrath has positive earnings, so they have a 16 PE. Avis has a better price of sales. We can't look at their price to book. They're below one in current ratio. We can't look at the ROE. They're 100% debt. And their market cap is 6.3 billion. And they're about three times the size of McGrath. So to summarize, I have them trading at an 8% premium. And with Hertz filing bankruptcy, this gives them an opening to take more market share. 
I do not think this company will fall bankruptcy. Since the worst of COVID has passed, I think they should do fine now. I rank their free cash flows 5 out of 10, but I'm not using these free cash flows. I'm adding back the auto sales. I rank their revenue 4 out of 10, and I rank their ratios 3 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.